بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم In the name of Allah, the all merciful, the ever merciful, and the all praise and the blessings and salutations be upon the prophets and messengers from Adam alayhi salam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Welcome back to part number 16 in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. His life, his um, um, his connection with other people and the lessons that we can learn um, through the life of the Prophet, the life of the most beloved person to all the Muslims. Uh, my brothers and sisters, we ended with the end of year number five after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. And inshallah, we continue from that. The last theme of the last part, part number 15, was um, when, um, when soul, when your heart jumped to your throats. And we discussed the events of the battle um, of Al Khandaq, or the trench, or the parties, or the Confederates in that battle when there are a lot. Of Muslims have been tested and a lot of hypocrites have been tested too and also in that battle that when so many Muslims um, have been kind of exposed to their own truthfulness in their iman and they, they, they are many of them that they were truthful enough as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them uh, some of the believers, the being truthful, what they have promised or that pledged with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of them have passed away, some of them are waiting, and they never change their promise and pledge with Allah. Inshallah, today we're going to continue and build up from there. And the theme of today is actually a verse from the Quran, or a couple of verses from the Quran. The first one of them is from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number two, I think. Um, Ayah number 214 or 215. Uh, you may hate a thing, although it is good for you, and you may like or love something, although it is evil for you. Allah knows and you do not know. And also so we have another theme that's overlapping with this theme is called Inna Ma'al Usri Yusra. The last part we talked about Al Usr, the challenges, the troubles, and the tribulations that the Muslim have been have been had been going through during the battles of Al of Al Khandaq, the trench, the battle of trench in year number five after the Hijra, and also competing with with the treason and the betrayal of the southern tribe, Jewish tribe that's called Bani Quraida. So today, inshallah, we're building up from here, from where we stopped, and we will see across the events that we're going to discuss in today's part, we will see these themes are present and they are kind of like manifested in some ways with the Muslims. Because in these two, um, in the, we're discussing just one year, but in that year, year number six, between year number five and number six, and probably the beginning of the, the end of year number six, we will learn how the Muslims have been questioning the early Muslims or the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, had questioned some choices that the Prophet had made, but in these choices, there's goodness for them. And also we will learn about after the difficulties of the battle of Al Khandaq or the trench, we will see some ease going on. So let's start discussing this in more details and share our slides for the people who would like to write or the people who would like to take notes about what we're going to talk about inshallah today. So uh, today is part number 16 in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And today's the beginning is when we ended up last time, we said the Prophet told them after the Quraysh and the Confederates left Medina after besieging the Medina for almost a month, the, the Prophet told them, now you will attack them. Now you will raid them. After them being attacking the Muslims multiple times, around five or six times, they tried to come to Medina. The Prophet promised the Muslims that now it is time to be more defensive, but not in your hometown, to go to their places. This is why we will see that year has tons of military expeditions and military units around, I'm not sure how many military units, around like 10 military units that in just one year, almost like one military unit 
every month. And some of the military units have been sent by the Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to defend the Medina because that's a time that if Medina doesn't prove and the inhabitants of Medina did not prove that they are strong enough to protect themselves, the tribal society that's been predominant in the Arabian Peninsula will come after the Muslims. The first military unit that we have learned of, it's led by someone called Muhammad ibn Salama. Um, Muhammad ibn Salama was one of the very special knights and uh, skillful soldier of the Prophet that he used to send him to many military units. So he went to some people called Bani Qarra. And the Bani Qarra, they actually participated in the Confederates with almost 6,000 soldiers out of the, the 10,000 soldiers. So the Prophet, after they left, he went to them with that military units to scare them and to plant fear among them, not to repeat that action by joining the Confederates by joining the Confederates and attacking Medina. That's the first one. And then we have another military unit. Um, that's not military unit, but when the Muslims coming back, they captured someone called the Thumama ibn Uthal. Thumama ibn Uthal, who was one of the leaders of people in the northern eastern side of a peninsula Arabia, which is the modern day Bahrain or Qatar or Dubai, I think, like around that area, United Arab Emirates. So they from a tribe called Bani Hanifa. Thumama ibn Uthal was very distinguished figure and the prophet was very keen to make him a Muslim. Why? Because he is a leader of a very prominent and, uh, and a very strong tribe. And we said before that the prophet used to connect with the tribes because the society's nature was based in that and the building um, allies and connecting with the tribe leaders because that's securing uh, the Muslim safety and the Medina safety too, besides being Muslims too. So Thumam ibn Uthal refused to become a Muslim and the Prophet treated him in the nicest way that a person, he was a hostage, he was taken as a hostage. The people who took him as a hostage, they didn't know that who he was. When the Prophet uh, saw him, he knew who he was and they treated him very nicely and they made sure that he is fed and he's been taken care of and they kept asking him to become a Muslim but Thumab ibn Uthal refused and rejected the offer from the Prophet, peace be upon him. So the Prophet eventually told them, leave Sumama and tie him. It was tied in the, one of the columns of the Masjid of the Prophet Wasallam, And he asked them to leave him and then tie him. And they told him, you're free. When he learned about this, Thumama, that the Prophet asked for his release, he went, took a shower, and then came back to become a Muslim. And that teaches us something very nice that the Prophet used to understand people from their own personalities and he used to connect to the people from their own personality. You know that that person is a person of pride coming from a very prideful tribe, but he treated him in the nicest way that can a person can be treated. So eventually that being kind of like cultivated in his conversion to Islam. And later on, he went to Mecca to make a Umrah to make a small hajj. He went to Mecca by himself and he told the people of Mecca that he's a Muslim, but when they got very angry with him, he told them, I swear that I will not let you, any, let any caravan pass by my town, which is Bani Hanifa, and unless the prophet approves it, which makes the Meccans got really scared because they have a lot of caravans that's the route towards like the east and the northeast, which is Iraq and the parts of Syria, modern day Syria. So they got very scared of that to the point that they went to the prophet um, to ask him to allow Thumama ibn Uthal to let their caravans pass by his town. That's number two. Number three, we have another unit that's led by someone called Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, one of the 10 people Ten companions that have been explicitly brought, uh, told that they're going to Jannah. It was sent to something called Sayful Bahr. Sayful Bahr is the sword of the. Uh, it's the literal meaning of the word Sayful Bahr. It means the sword of the sea, which means the coast of the sea. So they went to the coast of the sea to uh, to to kind of like show the other tribe tribes 
that actually they were, as Muslims, they were strong and they were going out um, as a unit to make sure that the, that's safe, the, the coast of the sea, because Medina is very close to the, to, the, to the Red Sea, by the way. So, and there's something we can learn, listen from that unit. That unit is the unit that taught us that everything from the sea is halal for Muslims. Every dead uh, creature in the sea is halal, like fish, shrimp, uh, whales, um, uh, tahalib, all kinds of like different uh, crabs and different types of, of uh, sea creatures um, are halal. That's the statement, that's, where, uh, that's the reason from the statement of the Prophet that says, Al-Bahru Al-Tahuru Ma'uhu Al-Hillu Maytatahu. Like it's a water, it's tahur to make wudu from the water, the sea's water and the, the, the Nile's water or the river's water. That's halal for the Muslims to eat from its own dead um, uh, creatures like fish and others. So the unit suffered a food shortage until they actually ate tree leaves and woods. And then they found a dead whale that in the corner of the sea that died and then it, it came to the corner of the sea and that was enough for them to eat from it for a month. And when they came back, they had some pieces of it that the, the prophet asked about it and then they give it to him and then he ate from that whale. That's the number three. We have also another unit, military unit, is led by Abdul Rahman ibn Awf to uh, a tribe called Dawmat al-Jandal. It's near the Roman territories in the north, which inhabitants are actually Christian Arabs from Bani Kalb tribe. So a tribe called Bani Kalb. And that was like in Shaban in month number eight in the Islamic calendar in year number six. Um, the, Abdurrahman ibn Awf connected with them and the, that tells us and teaches us about like the fabrics of the social cohesion of the society at the time that he got married to the daughter of, of, the, of a, 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 a uh, a Saif ibn Amru, her name is Tamadur, and he was the chief man of the Bani Kalbin Dalmati Jindal, and that significant marriage, intertribal marriages in the Arabian Peninsula in the past, we used to connect uh, the tribes together and used to connect the tribes. Why? Um, when somebody, because that teaches us something about the Arabs back in the time, L uh, family or blood li lineage, and marriages ties are very strong ties, very, very strong. So if somebody needs to connect with a certain tribe, they get married to someone, to the, to the daughter. And I think that was common too in the European countries in the past. So they used to connect it through the, the inter-tribal or inter-country or inter-state marriages. That connect because they consider now uh, the leader of the, the husband is the, has, uh, has his in-laws from his wife. So it is far-fetched to fight your in-laws um, and part of your family. That teaches us about some, some parts of this. Also, number five, or the, the fifth unit, or the fourth unit, actually, Bani Lahyan tribe expeditionary unit. The Bani Lahyan, they betrayed the Muslims. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi they, they betrayed the Muslims when they came to the Prophet. They asked for some Muslims to come with them to teach them about Islam. And on the way back, they killed the Muslim messengers, which is really, really uncommon and un a taboo thing to do to kill messengers. Uh, that were sent, even though they are from an army that's your, your, your enemies. So the Prophet sent a unit to them, but that was, uh, they, they did that in year number four or three. So the Prophet sent a unit to them in year number six. So here the Prophet Muhammad, as a leader, as a political leader and as an army leader, this is why the Orientalists or the people of the history, they, they talk about the Prophet, he wasn't just a religious person as some uh, of the, uh, the writers were talking, he was also a successful person in life as a leader, as a, as a military, and also as, um, as a, a political and social leader too, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he sent them that expedition to 
deter their attack or the thought of attack anymore. That's number five. Number six is the Battle of Al Ghaba or the Qarad. This battle happened in year number six. The Qarad is actually a water source area. And the reason for this battle is to respond to the attack of Uyayn ibn Hasn al Fizari, one of the leaders from Bani Fizar, who attacked actually, actually a, an area in the neighborhood or the suburbs of Medina called Al Ghaba or the forest area that has trees which has livestock that that area used to be the, the area where the Muslims and the Prophet وسلم, used to leave their livestock and animals to, to, to in that area. And these livestock were belonging to Muslims near Medina. And so he attacked that area, killed Dhir ibn Abi Dhir al-Ghafari, the, the one that, that was assigned or hired by the Prophet to take care of the, of the livestock. And they took his wife as a prisoner of war or as a hostage. This is why the Prophet went after them, uh, sent a unit after them. Uh, no, the Prophet actually participated in that one. And he, the Prophet went, but, uh, and he went after them until they actually freed Layla. Layla was the wife of Dhir ibn Abi Dhir al-Ghafari, who, um, uh, uh, who was taken as a hostage. And she managed to escape actually in a camel. That was the camel of the Prophet. And we have a really funny and also uh, interesting story that happened at that time. Someone called Salama ibn al awqa Salama ibn al awqa was one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and he was a very smart person and he was really skillful in throwing arrows. He was very, very skillful and he was very uh, fit. And that tells us about the physical fitness of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, they were really keen in their physical fitness because that tells us from that story. He was someone that's really fast, who was a fast runner, and he was someone that was really skillful in throwing arrows. So he actually managed to make the people of the Qarat, the people who come by the leadership with Uyayn ibn Hass, managed to, to stop them from running away for a period of time until the Muslims managed to come to the area, probably an hour or two. What he used to do, he used to throw the arrows at them. And then when they come, he runs fast and they couldn't catch him. And he comes back again, it's like a street fight. And he comes back again through the arrows and they run after him, he couldn't catch him. He was, pre he was pretty fast, he was very, very fast um, runner. Um, and it's very interesting that he was telling them, uh, take it from me, take this arrow from me, and I'm the son of Al-Awqa who's been prideful of his lineage. So one of the, one of the people running away from him is saying, Ala um, didn't you just like do not throw this somewhere at some other times? So it's very interesting to learn the lessons from that story and to see like how a companion of the Prophet, how one person managed to stop almost like a couple hundred of people from running away with the livestock for a period of time and how much fitness he was. That tells us how strong and fit and, uh, and very up to the, to the forms, physical fitness uh, among the companions. They were very physically fit, fit, by the way. Some of them used to climb mountains climb a whole mountains and come back again down one or two times. And for the people who are residents of Colorado, they know what climbing mountains look like. And now the mountains have trails, have like paved, paved trails. Imagine the mountains in the back, they didn't have that much. So that's another one. Number seven is Ukasha ibn Mehsan, unit to Rabi, uh, uh, Rabi al-Thani, that was here to Bani Asd. Ukash ibn Mahsan, one of the companions of the Prophet, was sent also with another unit to, to deter the threats from some people called Bani As. Number eight is Muhammad ibn Maslama, again, unit to Bani Thalaba. And in that one, the Prophet sent 10 Muslims as a military unit. They were surrounded, most of these units, by the way, between um, 10 to 100 or 200. So they're not very big uh, military units, but to kind of like, deter the threats and to plant fear among 
the, the, the tribes that actually represent a threat to Medina. So Muhammad ibn Maslam went to Bani Thalaba, but they made an ambush for him and they were surrounded and all the nine out of the 10 killed except Muhammad ibn Maslam, who was the only one that severely wounded. And he came back to the Prophet telling him about what happened um, with his unit. And then after this, the mission unit led by Zayd ibn Haritha to uh, al Is to capture a caravan of Quraysh and they captured the uh, al as ibn Rabi'a. They captured the caravan and they captured someone that's really prominent. We need to learn about that name. His name is al Asu ibn al Rabi'a. He was actually the husband of the Prophet Muhammad's uh, daughter, uh, Zainab, radiallahu anha. And he was her cousin. He was the son of Hala bint Khwalid, the sister of Khadija bint Khwalid, the mother of Zainab. So he was her cousin from her mother's side. So his mom is her aunt. Um, so al as ibn, ibn Rabi'a, he was married to Zainab bint Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he didn't want to become a Muslim. So she immigrated to Medina by herself and they stayed, they were married, but she, they didn't seek divorce from him. She waited for him and he was, and that was six years later, he was captured as a prisoner of war. See what happened. He went to her to seek his protection, to seek his wife's protection. So the prophet went to her and approved this and told her, my daughter, he is not a Muslim. He shouldn't touch you. And he approved her protection. She went in like at Fajr time, like while everything is dark and said, O oh, people of Medina, al as ibn Rabi'a is under my protection. And eventually he became a Muslim and they stayed together after this until she passed away. Um, that's number nine. Number 10 in Sha'ban or uh, in the same year, a mission unit was led by Ali ibn Abi Talib to Bani Sa'd ibn Bakr, which were mobilizing to attack Medina. So they were Bani Bakr, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi ibn, ibn Bakr, they were one of the tribes in, in the Arabian Peninsula. They were mobilizing people to attack Medina again and to make another confederate. So the Prophet وسلم, sent the mission led by Ali ibn Abi Talib to deter this and stop it from the beginning. If you see, we're talking about now, at the beginning, since the, the beginning of the Medina time, that tells us about something, looking deeper in the history and looking deeper in the times, we see a big, uh, common thing. All of these units and all of the battles so far, and inshallah we will know until the end, all of them are having a defensive style, a defensive uh, difai, defensive style that to protect the Medina and to make sure that they are safe. Because that type of society that's been fabricated or built in a tribalism and built in a way that to support my tribe and my clan and support uh, the, against my enemies or the enemies that re represent something. And also to take as much resources from other tribes as much as you can. They were raiding tribes just to use their resources. Well, Medina was very resourceful place because it has trees and it plants and one of the few places in Arabian Peninsula that plants, that grow plants um, because of the rest of them are mostly deserts. So all of these ones that require from the Muslims to protect that, that town, to be able to be free and to connect the people to Allah and to spread the Islam in a more peaceful, connected societies uh, other than the tribal societies that we have been experiencing. So let's take a pause here and they can confirm this. We see the common theme here is we will attack not only those who attack us directly, rather those who threatens the, the Muslims and our security. It's called a defensive attack or something connected to the homeland security that we can, the homeland security of Medina is by making sure that the ones who are actually mobilizing people and kind of like attacking uh, the Medina by in indirect way. This is a defensive approach as we see because otherwise Medina would be attacked from any tribe near or far. We continue, we have another Actually, a couple, three units. The unit of Bani Uraina, uh, or Arina, or Okel. Those are the ones who portrayed the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet said, what happened is these people came to the Medina. They wanted to become Muslims. 
the Prophet accepted their Islam and he gave them a shepherd and give them a bunch of different animals to as prisons for them. And they, they, they let them stay in Medina for a little bit. So he hosted them, accepted the conversion, and they pr protected them and sent them a shepherd. What they did after they left Medina, they killed the shepherd and they fled and they attacked some Muslims. And uh, in that one, the verse in the Quran about the ruling of Hiraba. The Hiraba means um, the ruling of Hiraba is the people who terrorize other people, the terrorism, the concept of terrorism in Islam, the people terrorize other people uh, by doing certain actions that terrorize peaceful people. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, um, so that types of haraba, Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran that those who fight Allah and fight his messenger and they spread corruption and destruction in earth, their punishment is to be killed. That's the, the concept of restorative justice that we see, because some people use as that incidence that the Prophet treated them by killing them and not just killing them, crossing them too, uh, putting them in a cross. Uh, some people will, it's a tricky misunderstanding. They say, see how violent it was, but it wasn't that superficial understanding. It was deeper because these people actually betrayed the host, uh, the host uh, betrayed the, the nice and the hospitability of the Prophet. They killed the shepherd that was sent with the Prophet to protect them. They stole, so they stole, they killed, they betrayed the, the pledge and they betrayed and they caused uh, the, the betrayal or the treason. So there's uh, a tricky thing here that people might say, uh, look how Muslims are violent or how Muhammad sallallahu was violent, but actually that's not um, as superficial as the people think. It has a deeper meaning behind it. That's uh, unit number 11 in the same year. Unit number 12, or actually 11, the mission unit was sent by Abdullah ibn Atik to assassinate someone. So at the time of the Prophet, as a political reader, they executed assassination. And the assassination, some people would say, oh, oh my God, so what's happening to the prophethood or the prophet of mercy? If you look deeper, this assassination, and that's not the first one, by the way, was sent by two assassinate someone called Abu Rifa'a Salam ibn Abil Haqiq. That was someone that was mobilizing a tribe called Khaybar, who was one of the Jews who were uh, expelled because they tried to kill the Prophet from Bani um, Nadir, I think. Um, so when he went to a city called Khaybar, he mobilized them to try to attack Medina as the Quraysh did and he was mobilizing and calling people. So the Prophet sent him someone called Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Atik to assassinate him. And among, and among another three companions. So they went, and actually there was a request from uh, Al-Khazraj uh, when, uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu they requested to take, to go and assassinate that person because he's causing or he's a reason or source of threat for the whole population Medina and causing destruction in Medina. So the Prophet sent him and he managed to kill him and we have details in that, but because of our time, we do want to go in the details. You can go to the references by these names or you can write them down. And inshallah, this video is always available on YouTube and the, well, and the Facebook. So you can come back and then write the names and search deeper in the units and the assassination uh, process of that. There's a very long hadith also reported in Al-Bukhari um, about the details of the assassination narrated by Abdullah ibn Atik himself um, when he, how he assassinated uh, Salam, uh, Abu Rufa'a Salam ibn Abi al-Haqib. Number 13 is the unit led by Abdullah ibn Rawaha to make sure that Khaybar, Khaybar is the city where uh, Abdullah ibn Atik is, from, is, is residing after the assassination to make sure that actually they're not mobilizing against Muslims and not trying to form another confederate against Medina. Um, and they tried to go to someone, Ali Asai, 
Ali Yusayim, to he was one of the leaders of the Jews to come to talk to the Prophet, so the Prophet can talk to him to to make a treaty with him that he secure the the Khyber safety and also he secured that Khyber would not attack Medina. But uh, Ali Sir actually changed his mind in the way coming to Medina and he wanted a bunch of other Muslims and they killed some Muslims and then they ran away back to Khyber. So that's the 11 unit. So we stop at this point and we need to pause a little, a little bit and confirm the things that actually we, uh, we talked about before. The first thing that we need to confirm here is all of this was defensive approaches all of them is to protect the Medina. All of the, these units was to make sure that the Medina or the city of the Prophet is safety as a political and social and governmental leader. His job as the, as the Prophet Muhammad his job is to protect uh, the safety and security of the inhabitants and the citizens of that town in, in a very tribal um, uh, communities or neighborhoods or, or neighboring tribes. So this is, that now makes a lot of sense for people um, and is not fair to make sure, it's not fair to kind of like superficially jump to conclusions and say, oh, all of these units and all of these military units, all of them has a, a defensive approach. Now we're going to another shift in the history of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet saw a dream and when the prophets uh, see a dream according to Muslims belief, is not just a dream like our dreams, it is a, a revelation from them. So he wanted to go to make Umrah to Mecca. Before we learn about this, let's see the position of Kaaba in Mecca. To make Umrah, Umrah means a small hajj. So it's not the hajj that we know, it's a, it's a small one. And it's voluntary and you can do as many as you want in your lifetime. And at, at any time during the year. So he wanted to make Umrah to Mecca. The Kaaba is considered by all the Arabs as a public ritual place, which means that Meccans take care of it, but is not exclusively possessed by Mecca. The same thing that what we have now with the Kaaba. The Kaaba is something for all Muslims. All the Muslims have the right to go there and all the Muslims have the right to pray in the Masjid of Al-Haram where Kaaba is, is um, built and is sitting. Uh, but now with the modern society, you see like Saudi Arabia is controlling a lot of uh, visa entries and to make it to make sure that the people numbers are limited to certain numbers because to make sure that that's actually what they can handle every year. But anyway, so when the Prophet wanted to make Umrah, that's his own right. Even though if Quraysh is his enemy, they cannot stop him. Why? Because that's a public place that's open for all. And that's the pledge that was given unknown and kind of like informally known among all the Arabs that that's the Baytullah al-Haram, the house, the sacred house of Allah, the sacred house of God. So, so the Prophet decided to go and make Umrah in Medina. When he decided to go and make Umrah in Medina, uh, sorry, go make Umrah in Mecca from Medina. The and then they stopped him. So the Prophet saw a dream to do Umrah. So Muslims set off, he told the Muslim to, to get ready and to wear the ihram cloth or the sacred um, or uh, the inviolable cloth that's very like two pieces of cloth, Rida and, Iz and Izar for the males and for the females, it's uh, like simple clothes, not uh, f flourish. And some people prefer to wear white females and some females prefer colored and some other females prefer green and some other females prefer black, whatever, whatever. But it's all of this is called a state of ihram, a state of inviolability or, or a state of sacredness that the, actually that's the state that Everybody sees them, that they knows that actually that they are in a mission to pilgrimage to Medina. So he told the Muslims to do that. But he was a political reader too. So he did, first he sent Muslim scouts to make sure that there were no potential threats to Muslims in the way. Because the Muslims, when they are in the state of 
ihram, they are not holding um, arms. They're not holding big arms. So maybe somebody, because even though it is known among the people that nobody shouldn't touch the people who are actually in a state of ihram or state of inviolable or, or a sacred a sanctuary uh, to, to do hajj or to do umrah, but he, the Prophet was being extra careful with that. And also the Umar radiallahu anh, suggested that the Muslims should have arms, but light arms in case Quraysh choose to fight. And he did something smart too. They went out from Medina, they set off from Medina to Mecca, going uh, in the state of Ihram, but he assigned some of the Muslims to, uh, to, to, to have camels carrying arms and they go with a few people that lead in these camels to go after the Muslims, uh, but leave a period of time between them in case if there's a war happens. Because what? They are not in a state, uh, they are not having any treaty or any truce with anyone. So they, any tribe can attack this armless people that go into Mecca to do ihram, even though it is not known among the Arabian Peninsula, because even though if my enemy is instead of Ahram, I have to protect and stop him, uh, to, to protect uh, him and not to hurt or harm him. This is why we also we know the four months of uh, of uh, of sacredness. These are the four months that actually were known among Arabs that no one should attack anyone. They should take a truce from this. So once the Quraysh heard of the prophets coming, they started preparing actually for a long war. They said, no, he will not enter Mecca at all, which is against that what's known among the Arabs back in the time. And they said, no, he will not go. He, he forced himself to come to Mecca. So he, will not, he was not coming and then they stopped him. So the Muslims had to camp in a place called Asfan and the group of the Quraysh horsemen approached them and they tried to attack them. And there was a time that the Prophet Sallallahu and that was the time that we learned as Muslims to pray the fear prayer or Salatul Khawf that's mentioned in, I think in Surah An-Nisa, um, uh, in two verses in Surah An-Nisa, when, uh, when Allah taught us how to pray uh, Salatul Khawf. And Salatul Khawf, that's the Salah that the pillars of prayers are, are negotiated and not all the pillars of prayers are fulfilled. Like let's say you're praying Dhuhr, which is the second prayer in the day, which is four rakahs, four sets of motions. Um, in Salat al-Khawf, you can pray them too. And the half of the army prays with the leader and then uh, the other half of the army protects the, the half that's praying. And then after that, the uh, half that was praying leaves the Salah after the second rakah, and then the other half that's protecting them joins the Salah and then they switch the rules and protect it. And also the, the talking in that prayer that they negotiate in the Qiyam, uh, or the standing pillar of prayer and other ones. And in that case, we learn a lesson here, my brothers and sisters. We learn the lesson how important and significant prayers are for the people who do not keep in their prayers. I know you. I was in that place at the, that time. I know the, the struggle sometimes. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. If you have the good intentions, oh Allah, I need to pray. I need to connect with you. Even I'm struggling with my focus in prayer, even if I'm not for cultivating the old fruits in prayers, I need to guide me, help me, help me to connect with you more. And do research and try to learn from other cultures and other traditions. Learn how to, to learn the focus of prayers. I was in a meeting, I was actually in a meeting with a Jewish rabbi and he was telling me like how he was praising the Muslim prayers because he said that engages your body in it. So if you focus a little bit and your body moves, your breathing and your connection and having that state of khushua, the word khushua is focus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dua for this. Um, in that, in the middle of war, the Prophet was keen along his life to maintain the prayers on time. A war, my brothers and sisters, a war, not uh, busy in our works or busy in somewhere else or playing or something like that. We're talking about a war that at the moment, at any moment, you can be attacked and killed. 
he was maintaining the, the prayers on time to make sure that everyone is keeping his prayers in time. And we learned from that uh, treaty that Muslims prayed Salat al khawf because they have horsemen watching them. So they wanted to make sure that the army is safe. And that teaches us another lesson too, that the safety of the bodies and the human uh, soul and bodies is very important and our prayers can be flexible around us. This is why we learned also that you can pray in your car uh, if you're actually traveling, you can pray in your car if you're afraid that something is going to happen in an area that doesn't seem safe to you and so other things in terms of the fiqh or the Islamic laws or Islamic sharia. Also, um, when the Prophet saw the horsemen, so he, they changed the directions and then they camped at a place very close to Mecca. It's called Al Hudaybiyah Hill. It's like a, a mount. After Al, Al Qawsa, the camel of the Prophet knelt down south of Mecca, and that place was south of Mecca. So the Muslims camped there. This is why we called it the Treaty of Hudaybiyah because it happened in another place called Al Hudaybiyah, and that was January 6 to a, uh, 28 AD, which is six. Uh, at the end of the sixth year after the Hijrah of the Prophet. So the Muslims camped there in the city of Ihram. They wanted to go to Mecca to make the Umrah. The Quraysh on the other side, they say, no, he will never come to Mecca. And there was kind of like healing moments at this time. So the Quraysh sent at the beginning someone called Budailu ibn Warqa from Khuza'a. Uh, Budailu ibn Warqa from Khuza'a, it was sent by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to negotiate and offer a truce to Christ to show them that the Muslims are not coming to fight. They're just coming to perform a ritual and then go back to their own town. Um, when Budail ibn Warqa came to tell Quraysh about the truce, they didn't trust him because he's from a tribe called Khuza and Khuza is a tribe that leans towards the Medina more than Quraysh. So they sent someone called Urwa ibn Mas'ud. Aura ibn Mas'ud, he was from a tribe, a rival tribe to Khuza'a called, called um, 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 I forget the name, is Bani Bakr, I think. Um, uh, so they went, he's, he, he was sent by Quraysh to the Prophet to see exactly why he's coming to Mecca. It doesn't make any sense. You, you just had a fight and had a war with us. We wanted to attack you a year before that, and now you're coming to, Medi to Mecca. So... It seems that you are fighting or you wanted to fight or something. They sent Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to see exactly what's going on here. Uh, uh, Arwa ibn Mas'ud, I mean. So he went and uh, because he didn't believe Budal and did that. So Arwa, when he went, he was very mean and very, um, he was very mean with the Prophet and very at, uh, like, um, aggressive with the prophet. We, and usually in the past, when they would talk to someone and they, um, they hold each other's uh, beards, that's kind of a tradition. So Arwa tried to implicitly threaten the prophet and call him something by telling him, you never know how strong Christ is. If you just come closer, you're going to be annihilated, you're going to be killed and all of that. And something very interesting happened that Aurus ibn Mas'ud's uh, um, nephew, someone called al mughir ibn Shu'bah from the same tribe, he was a Muslim and he was the bodyguard that protects the Prophet while they're meeting together. So he was wearing his helmet, he was fully armed with his sword while Aurus while is talking to the Prophet. And while Aurus is trying to hold the Prophet's beard, al mughira jumps to him and then pushes away his arm and tell him, do not touch the prophet. So Arwa was kind of like confused, like how much he has seen the prophet highly protected, highly uh, rever revered and highly um, um, reverent by, by, the, by the Muslims and by the people. So he told the prophet, who's that young man who keeps doing this? He said, he's your, he's your nephew. So he got shocked by this. His own nephew is pushing away him uh, from talking mean and, ta and responding back to him from talking mean to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he's trying to understand why he's coming and threaten him in an implicit way. So that's another ways of negotiation started between the Prophet and Quraysh. So after this, Quraysh sent another one. So when Arwa ibn Mas'ud came, he said to Quraysh, and actually that has been flipped upside down. 
he went to make sure that he threatens the prophet so he, he makes him afraid to come close and go back to Medina. Actually, the impact of his meeting with the prophet, he went actually and he threatened Quraysh without knowing. He told them, I have been to many kings and I've been to many uh, leaders, but I haven't seen anyone highly protected and highly respected by his followers more than Muhammad is with his followers. The companions was very, and that's, that's by the way, that's the psychological word that, that, that was implemented here by making sure that the enemies know that, that you're not messing around with the leader of another, um, uh, uh, the leader of the Muslims, which is in that case, the Prophet So they sent someone called Al-Hulaysu ibn Al-Qama. Each one of the people that we're seeing now, Budayl ibn Al-Warqa, Urwa ibn, ibn Mas'ud, um, and Al-Hulays ibn Al-Qama, each one of them has a certain personality. Urwa ibn Mas'ud is a personality when the Prophet saw him, he said that this person is not a good person. This person is someone that's very cunning and very threatening. Um, he knows his personality and he dealt with him in a right way by making sure that the Muslims actually show him how highly protected uh, the Prophet is. So if Christ dares to come closer and attack the Muslims and try to kill the Prophet, they wouldn't be able to come because these are people who are willing to kill themselves for the Prophet Then the, when they said, sent someone called Al-Hulays ibn Al-Qama, he's someone of, sanct, of sacredness. He's someone that respects the house of Allah, which is Al-Kaaba, and respects Al-Hadi. Al-Hadi means that um, the, the reserved um, animals that are going to be slaughtered for the people who do the Hajj. So when the Prophet saw this, he told the companions and told the Muslims to leave the reserved animals in his face, so in his way while he was coming to meet the Prophet, to make sure that he sees them. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that he knows that the Muslims are coming in peace to just perform the small Hajj. He is a man of sanctified. Uh, who is the man who sanctified the house of Allah? That's what the Prophet said. So. So they stowing the uh, had in his way. And once he saw them, he couldn't continue because he's a person that really respects the sanctified and sanctified the house of Allah. So he returned back to Quraysh before even meeting the Prophet, telling him, you need to let this man come because he comes in peace to just perform Umrah. You see how he was a, a successful political and social and, uh, and also um, uh, a religious leader too. That's why it was amazing for many writers, especially in the West, to see how the personality of the Prophet was playing a role in actually connecting and building um, one of the biggest um, um, history in the world. After this, <coughs> the Prophet sent someone called Kharash ibn Umayyad al-Khuza'i to Quraysh to negotiate with them. Once he arrived, they threatened him they held his camel, they killed his camel, and that's something that's not common and taboo from Christ to do and from the Arabs to know of, which makes the, because it's like what? It's like the all the Arabs are watching now. All the Arabs are not, uh, the, that uh, all the Arabs and tribes they're watching who is going to do, to win. Is the Muhammad is going to win over Christ by going to Mecca, or is Christ is going to win over him by pushing him away? So all the Arabs have been watching, but they know what should be done. And they learn that this man is coming in a, in, a, in a peaceful way, coming to perform the Hajj to a public religious place and then go back. But the Christ is stopping him, which created some kind of like disrespect among the Arabian uh, tribes um, against Quraysh. So when the Prophet sent, uh, um, sent uh, Kharash ibn Umayyad al-Khuza'i, they killed the camel that makes the people be more disrespectful and downgrade Christ more. How come he do this? After this, the Prophet sent someone, um, the, the, his, his uh, son-in-law and his companion, Uthman ibn Affan, um, he wanted to send Umar first, but Umar told him, I'm not from a big clan in Quraysh. These are people from Quraysh. Umar told him, I'm not from a big clan in Quraysh. So I would suggest that you send Uthman ibn Affan because he's from Umayyad clan and they will protect him even though they know that they're Muslims. 
So Quraysh kept him for a little bit and told him, Uthman, if you want to do your Umrah, your small Hajj, do it. But the Muslims know, and they said, no, I will not going to do anything until the Prophet comes here. So, but there were rumors spread around because Osman was kept a little bit in Quraysh for a little bit, for a period of time. So there was rumors that spread around that uh, Uthman was killed. In that case, the Prophet told the 1400 Muslims that went to make Umrah with him, he asked them to convene and make a pledge called the Pledge of Ridwan or Pledge pledge of uh, being pleased with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pledge them for patience and not to flee in the battle and for death. Why? In that case, the Muslims learned that Quraysh is not letting them in. Quraysh is being very aggressive, being very unfair, and they killed their messenger. So the Prophet told them that all of us are going to fight if Uthman really died or Uthman really was killed. And in that case, when Quraysh learned about this, that the all 1400 Muslims pledged to die for the cause, they kind of got shaken from within. So they sent someone called Suhailu ibn Amr. Suhailu ibn Amr, who's a man of negotiation. When the Prophet saw him, he learned that Quraysh wanted a resolution and a breakthrough. So a treaty was made and endorsed by the Muslims and the Quraysh by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that treaty, that's why it's called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. It's a truce. These are the articles of the treaty. A truce for 10 years. Between both of them, no one attacks the other. And actually, that was good in itself. And I will tell you why. This is why we have the theme. You, might, you may hate something, and there's good in it. And you may love something, and there's evil in it. That's the first article. The second article, any tribe can join either of the camps. They can join the Muslims or they can join the Quraysh. No one should be returned if he choose to come to Mecca, leave in Islam, but not the same for Muslims. And it seems unfair, but I will tell you what it's meant behind this. All are safe to go to Mecca or to pass by Medina. So safety and peace. No entry this year for the Muslims, so the Muslims have to return back that year, but Next year, they have the right to come to Mecca to perform the small Hajj for three days. And all will abide by this and not uh, stealing from each other and not asking of treachery. When the Prophet signed this, the Muslims were really, really sad and mad. Why? Because it seems at the first glance, that's really unfair. How come if anyone from Quraysh comes to become a Muslim, we, pu we push them away? And we have to turn them to, to Quraysh again to their own persecutors and not the other way around. And how come that we, uh, uh, we didn't go to Mecca now perform Umrah and so other things. So the Prophet ﷺ was very, at very difficult time to the point that Umar ibn Khattab went to the Prophet and told him, Ya Rasulullah, aren't you the messenger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, aren't you uh, protected by Allah? He said, yes. Aren't you the one that has the truth and they have the falsehood? He said, yes. And they said, why did you sign this? This is really unfair. Why do we accept? Uh, Umar ibn Khattab was really a prideful companion of the Prophet He was really strong in personality and physically too. Um, so he told, why do we accept something like this? We accept defeat among them. So the Prophet told him, Allah will not leave me alone and Allah will not let me down. So Umar was very mad and others were very mad among the Muslims. When the Prophet, to the point that the Prophet told them to slaughter Hadi and to end their state of ihram or state of sanctuary or state of inviolability, they, they did not do it. The Prophet asked them and he was very sad. He went to his, uh, his tent and his wife, his wise wife, Sayyidah Umm Salama, taught us a very lesson of wisdom of uh, wise wives and how they, they actually back up their, their husbands who happen to be leaders. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, they are sad. And I would suggest for you, you go now. Do not speak a word to anyone. Go to your own hadi, your own uh, camel, uh, or your own hadi that you are actually reserved to be slaughtered for the sake of Allah as a state of the haram parts of the rituals. Uh, slaughter it. Call the barber to shave your hair and do nothing. So the Prophet did exactly what he, what she told him. And all of them, once they saw the Prophet doing it, Everybody does it, and they came in the breakthrough. 
at the beginning, and we end up, that's the last slide, inshallah. The story of Abu Jandal, Abu Jandal, and that was the first person that the Muslims have to push away or to return them back to Quraysh. Abu Jandal was the son of Suhail ibn Amr, the one who signed the treaty on behalf of Quraysh with the Prophet who came the second, right after they signed the treaty, and he, told them, and he, he managed to escape because his father was imprisoning him for a, a years, for years, and he escaped and he came to the Prophet and told Ya Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim, I convert to Islam and I want to leave Quraysh and my father had been imprisoned me. And Suhail said, that's the first uh, one that we apply our treaty, O Muhammad, I'm taking my son because he's coming from Quraysh to the Prophet, to Muslims, so the Muslims have to turn him back. So the Prophet told Abu Jandal, you have to be patient and be patient. And, and it's very difficult. Imagining someone had been persecuted in his religion and the second he managed to escape the leader of the muslims telling him go back because we signed the treaty and we have to protect uh, we have to respect our words and our pledges you see how he was a man of his word even though that that was difficult sometimes to comprehend why um, he he pushed him away abu Jandil. so the prophet was protecting that so he he asked to end the ihram slaughtering, and we learned about that lesson. Also, the revelation of a chapter, a whole chapter in the Quran. And imagine the name of the chapter, the, the name of the chapter in the Quran that's talking about these events called Al Fatih, the victory. I like what the Muslims knew or thought. And this is why we have the theme in You Might Hate Something, and it has good in it. Um, and it ended at this point, inshallah, starting from part number 17, we're going to build from where we stopped after the Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah until, inshallah, the, the opening of Mecca in year number eight. So inshallah, the next time we're going to go year number seven and half of year number eight, inshallah, in part number 16. Jazakumullah khair and sorry for taking too long time, but actually that's very important to connect these events together. Jazakumullah khair. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته